Please be seated. Good afternoon. I am Joshua Wynn, Vice President for Health Affairs at the University of North Dakota and proud to be Dean of your School of Medicine and Health Sciences. On behalf of President Kelly, the University of North Dakota, and the faculty, staff, and students of the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, it is my privilege to welcome you to the commencement exercises for the graduating class of 2014. I want to thank Marie Shurek for being our sign interpreter, Dr. Michael Whitgraft, the pianist, and Michelle Walters, the proctor. To all of you, our guests and friends, we are very pleased that you are here. At this time, I would like to introduce the individuals on the platform. I would like to ask each to stand and remain standing until all are introduced. Please hold your applause until everyone has been introduced. University of North Dakota President, Dr. Robert Kelly. UND Registrar, Dr. Suzanne Anderson. Our commencement speaker, Dr. Clara Pomeroy, President of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. Our Associate Deans, Dr. Gwen Hallis, Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs. Dr. Joy Dorsher, Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions. Mr. Randy Aiken, Associate Dean for Administration and Finance. Dr. Charles Christensen, Associate Dean for Clinical Education. Dr. Nicholas Newman, Associate Dean of the Southwest Bismarck Campus. Dr. Julie Blem, Associate Dean of the Southeast Fargo Campus. Our Assistant Deans, Dr. Stephen Christensen, Assistant Dean for Students, Fargo. Dr. Susan Zalewski, Assistant Dean of the Northeast Grand Forks Campus. Dr. Martin Rothberg, Assistant Dean of the Northwest Minot Campus. Dr. William Newman, Assistant Dean for Veterans Affairs and Chair of Internal Medicine. Dr. Tom Hill, Assistant Dean for Preclinical Education. Dr. Kenneth Ruitt, Assistant Dean for Graduate and Undergraduate Education. Dr. Patrick Carr, Assistant Degree Assistant Dean for Faculty Development, and Dr. David Teige, Assistant Dean for Graduate Medical Education, who is unable to be with us today. Also on stage are the chairs of our basic and clinical science departments. The basic science chair is Dr. Malik Kotba, founding chair of basic sciences. The clinical science chairs are Dr. James Mitchell, clinical neuroscience, Dr. Robert Beatty, Family and Community Medicine, Dr. Zhao Xin Lu, Neurology, Dr. Dennis Lutz, OBGYN, Dr. Mary Ann Sens, Pathology, Dr. Stephen Tingley, Pediatrics, Dr. F Ted Fogarty, Radiology, and Dr. Robert Sticker of Surgery, who could not be with us today. Also on stage is Mr. Eugene Delorme, director of the Indians into Medicine program. Michelle Walters will announce the graduates as they come forward for the de their degree and hoods. We are honored to have several other special guests in attendance in the audience at today's commencement ceremony. Please join me in welcoming UND's Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. Tom DiLorenzo, and Susan Walton, our Vice President for University and Public Affairs. I would also like to introduce Deanna Carlson Zink, Executive Vice President and CEO of the UND Alumni Association and Foundation, and Hesham L. Ruini, uh, Dean of the College of Engineering and Mines.
In addition, we are delighted to have in attendance Judy Demers, our former Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions. Thank you, Judy, for traveling from Phoenix to be with the graduating class today. Today, almost half the physicians practicing in North Dakota and two-thirds of the state's family medicine physicians are alumni of the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences and our training programs. We have earned a national reputation for our commitment to rural medicine, and our students are welcomed at some of the most prestigious residency programs in the country. Ultimately, because of our school, North Dakota citizens benefit from accessible, high quality, and affordable health care when compared with most, most other states. The hope and promise that the people of North Dakota invested in us more than 100 years ago have been realized, and we look forward to achieving even greater levels of success and excellence in the next 100 years. Before us are 64 young men and women who have reached this point in their lives, not only in, by virtue of their own hard work and motivation, but because of the encouragement, support, inspiration, and love from their families and friends. I would like to acknowledge the sacrifices by their parents, husbands, wives, children, and others that have made this achievement possible. Would all of you, the support staff for these students, please rise for our applause and thanks. <clears throat> and in anticipation of Mother's Day tomorrow, I'd like to ask all of the mothers in the audience and on stage to stand for special recognition and thanks. <laughs> you may be interested to know that the students ranged in age from 21 to 37 years upon entering school. They came to medical school from throughout North Dakota and the region and the state's largest cities to its smallest. From places like Bowbells, Forest River, Medina, and Russo. Most of these stu students hold undergraduate degrees in biology or science disciplines, but many others have academic backgrounds in areas as diverse as English literature, interdisciplinary studies, entrepreneurship, and philosophy. Their varied backgrounds and interests, talents, and hobbies have helped to prepare them to be good, uh, to be good physicians and will serve them well as they move into their professional careers. The majority of the class received one of their top choices for residency training after medical school. Our students will continue their education for at least three additional years of training. They are moving on for training uh, in North Dakota, as well as the finest institutions throughout the United States. These graduates will be moving east to esteem programs at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, further east to Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, and south to the University of Oklahoma. They will be found at the residencies of the universities of Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, and North Dakota. For those of you who are going out of state, we invite you to come back to North Dakota to practice after your residency training. The graduating class is allowed to have faculty or physician family members of their choice participate in the hooding pr uh, process. Several of the graduates have elected to do so, and you will see this happen as the degrees are conferred and the hoods are placed. The names of the hooding mentors are listed in your program. A at this time, I would like to present some honored faculty members. 
In large member, the quality of our medical education is dependent on the many physicians throughout the state who serve as faculty members, but they are what we call voluntary faculty members. That is, they are not on our academic faculty, but they still teach medical students. They have added and incorporated this activity into their daily medical practices and welcomed our medical students to learn from them and their patients. The School of Medicine and Health Sciences wishes to honor some of these faculty members with the Dean's Special Recognition Award for Outstanding Volunteer Faculty. These physicians have gone above and beyond the call of duty in giving our students the benefits of their time, experience, knowledge, and wisdom gained from years of caring for patients. By example, they have served as superior role models and encouraged our students to define and adopt the highest standards of medical practice. It is my pleasure to present the following physicians with the Dean's Recognition Award for Outstanding Voluntary Faculty. I would ask the faculty member to come forward as I read their names. First, I'd like to present the award uh, to Dr. Michael Delalio, Clinical Assistant Professor of Clinical Neuroscience. Tandy Way Gray, Clinical Associate Professor of Internal Medicine. <clears throat> Jerry Obrich, Clinical Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <laughs> Sherry Stein, Clinical Assistant Professor of Family and Community Medicine. Michelle Tincher, Clinical Assistant Professor of Family and Community Medicine. And Beverly Tong, Clinical Assistant Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Several other recipients of this award could not be with us today, but I would like to acknowledge them. Brent Herbel, Clinical Assistant Professor of Radiology. Derek Kane, Clinical Assistant Professor of Surgery. Sarah Lind, Clinical Associate Professor of Pediatrics. Farhan Tariq, Clinical Assistant Professor of Clinical Neurology. And Caller Zacher, Clinical Professor of Pediatrics. The graduating class selected the following outstanding teachers who were recognized earlier today at the awards luncheon. Would you please stand if you are in attendance and join me, audience, please, in acknowledging them. Dr. Matthew Nelson, Bismarck Campus. Dr. John Raymond, Grand Forks Campus. Dr. Leonid Velinsky, Fargo Campus. And Dr. Jeffrey Verhey, Minot Campus. 
congratulations to each of you for the recognition and honor you have received. The Leonard Tao Foundation Humanism in Medicine Awards are given to a graduating medical student and medical school faculty who demonstrate compassion and sensitivity in the delivery of care to patients and their families. I would ask the following two individuals to please stand so we can acknowledge them, Amy Conson, graduate, and Dr. Roger Schauer, faculty member. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Claire Pomeroy, our keynote speaker. The keynote speaker at commencement is selected by the members of the graduating class, and we are delighted that she accepted their invitation. Dr. Pomeroy is president of the, Mary, of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. She serves as chief executive officer of the foundation and is responsible for overseeing the implementation of programs that advance the Foundation's mission to foster the prevention and treatment of disease and disability by honoring excellence in basic and clinical science and through public education and research advocacy. An expert in infectious diseases, Dr. Pomeroy is a longtime advocate for patients, especially those with HIV, AIDS, and public health. She passionately supports ongoing investment in the full range of research. She continues to lead an active research team in studying host responses to viral infections. She has a special interest in healthcare policy with a focus on the importance of social determinants of health. She has published more than 100 articles and book chapters and in her spare time edited three books. Dr. Pomeroy is a member of the Board of Trustees for the Morehouse School of Medicine and serves on the Board of Directors for the Sierra Health Foundation, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, and Pride Industries. She is co-chair of the Blue Ridge Academic Health Group and serves on the VA National Academic Affiliations Council. Past roles include chair of the Board of Directors for the Association of Academic uh, Healthcare Centers, Chair of the Council of Deans and Board Member of the Association of American Medical Colleges. She was elected in 2011 as a member at large representative for the American Association for the Advancement of Medical Science, Medical Science Section. Dr. Pomeroy was inducted into the Institute of Medicine also in 2011. Dr. Pomeroy received bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of Michigan Go Blue, and completed her residency and fellowship training in internal medicine and infectious diseases at the University of Minnesota. She also earned an MBA from the University of Kentucky. She has held faculty positions at the University of Minnesota, University of California, University of Kentucky, and is Professor Emerita at UC Davis. Dr. Pomeroy was Chief of Infectious Diseases and Associate Dean for Research and Informatics at the University of Kentucky. She, used, she joined the University of California Davis in 2003 as Executive Associate Dean and in 2005 was appointed CEO and Vice Chancellor of the Health System and Dean of the School of Medicine. She became president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation in June 2013. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Claire Pomeroy as the school's commencement keynote speaker. Dr. Pomeroy. Graduates, today is your day of celebration. Today, your hard work culminates in the great honor of receiving your MD degree. Today, your family, your friends, and your community celebrate your dedication and your successes. Today, you officially join a most noble profession, the profession of medicine. Congratulations. By virtue of the credential you now hold, 
by virtue of your soon-to-be new title of doctor, people will turn to you at their most vulnerable moments. They will share with you, as with no other, the intimate details of their bodies, their darkest fears, and their deepest hopes for the future. They will literally trust you with their lives. This trust is a gift and an honor, granted to you by those you have taken an oath to serve your patients. This trust derives from great respect for you and your new profession. Treasure that respect, but always remember that it is a gift that carries great obligations. The obligation to use your knowledge to benefit your patients. The obligation to always put your patients' needs above your own and embrace the value of altruism. The obligation to be a leader in your community, to take on the responsibility to address all the needs of all your communities, both locally and around the globe. You are graduating in an unprecedented time of challenge for our nation and for our profession. You will practice in an era of tremendous change as we rise to address the urgent need to reform our healthcare system and achieve our mission of ensuring better health for all. It has been said that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through bold vision, continuous work, and unflagging dedication. So as you accept your diploma today, as you accept this extraordinary gift of respect and trust, you are also accepting the charge to lead us in the change our country needs. Seize the moment. Use the power of your education to redesign our health care delivery system so that it is truly a health care system, not a sick care system. Use your knowledge to create a system that is person and family centric, a system that highlights prevention and wellness, a system that provides coordinated care, a system that is safe, accessible, and affordable. Most importantly, embrace your role as a societal leader and work to correct the parts of the healthcare system that fail to serve the principles of social responsibility and social justice. The United States has led and achieved advances in medical care from vaccines to transplants to DNA sequencing and more. These are extraordinary milestones of pro progress that we as health professionals and as a society can be proud of. But we cannot be proud of the fact that our country continues to experience unconscionable inequities in health access, quality, and outcomes. Our health care system remains inaccessible and unaffordable for far too many in our nation, and health care outcomes fall far short of what a great nation like ours should achieve. The United States spends more per capita than any other country in he on health care and yet has tragically disappointing outcomes. Despite spending almost twice as much per person compared to other developed nations, we rank among the worst in indicators ranging from infant mortality to life expectancy. We must proclaim that this is unacceptable. Our healthcare system today is characterized by shameful health disparities, disparities on the basis of race, ethnicity, geography, sexual orientation, immigration status, and socioeconomic status. Your health status should not be determined by the color of your skin or the zip code in which you live. We must proclaim that this is unacceptable. As Martin Luther King profoundly stated nearly five decades ago, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. And yet these disparities and inequities remain true today. Consider that African American women are more than twice as likely as white women to die of cervical cancer, or that people with less than a high school education are more than four times as likely as those with a college degree to report poor health. These are statistics. 
but their importance is in the lives of real people. Graduates, you learned about these realities during your years here at the University of North Dakota in your classrooms, and most importantly, in the faces and the stories of those you cared for in the hospital and clinics. You know that the need is urgent. The cost of inaction is no longer bearable. Robert Kennedy said, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. 64 students are graduating today. Together, you can set in motion multiple ripples, and those ripples can come together as an uplifting wave to improve health for all. So how do you do this? How do you choose the ripples you want to make? As you embark on this journey, the answers will come, I believe, if you can discover and follow your own moral compass. To do so, you need to look inside yourself to identify and explore your passions, and most importantly, define your core values and use them as the guide for all that you do. Our core values define who we are, what we prioritize, how we use the opportunities we are given. Our life experiences shape our core values, and those values in turn influence the life path we choose to follow. For most of us, our core values are rooted in our childhoods. For me, it began in a home that was full of abuse and fear, and by the time I was 14, the choice was clear, stay and risk my life or leave and learn how to survive on my own. So I escaped, running into the dark, just 14, scared and alone, uncertain where I would sleep or where I would get food to eat, and when a stranger gave me money to call a teen counseling center, I met people who found me a place to stay and helped me enter the foster care system. I lived in four foster homes. My first foster home was an emergency placement. And just as I was thinking maybe I could trust these people, it was time to go. And from this, I learned about how hard it can be for the vulnerable and abused to trust the system, to trust even those dedicated to caring. My second placement was with an African-American family who, though not quite knowing what to do with this blonde, blue-eyed white girl, opened their home with kindness. And from them, I learned about race and equality and social justice. And my third placement was also with an African-American family. They were welcoming, but I was wary. Then one day, I was doing the laundry, a load of whites, and I accidentally added a red sweatshirt. I was petrified. From my experiences growing up, I expected punishment and harsh words, and instead they said, it's okay. And suddenly we were united by a common color, pink. <laughs> From them, I learned about compassion and forgiveness. And my final placement was with a couple who became foster parents just to take care of me. And to them, I will always be grateful. They saved my life, and I learned that by giving of ourselves, we can give life to others. And so at 17, I aged out of the foster care system. I was on my own. I found a job, an apartment. I finished high school. I figured out how to pursue my dream of becoming a doctor. I learned about the importance of persistence and the power of having a dream. I beat the odds. People ask me today if my job as the president of the Lasker Foundation is hard. And I tell them that nothing is as hard as being 14 and being on the streets struggling to survive. But in a lot of ways, I was lucky. I was white and educated. I had foster parents who took care of me, teachers who believed in me. But I saw a lot of kids who were not so lucky, kids who were failed by the system, kids whose society was willing to throw away, kids who saw no future and therefore gave up hope. And from those children, I learned what really matters. From their teachings, 
My core values of caring for the vulnerable and fighting for social justice were born, and those core values have been my moral compass and have guided all that I have done since. I went on to complete medical school and my training in internal medicine and infectious disease, and then I entered practice. Just as a new, unknown, and at the time terrifying disease called HIV AIDS began claiming the lives of previously healthy gay men, I saw young men who looked like old men. Their bodies failing painfully and catastrophically from a devastating fatal illness. I saw them experience heartbreaking rejections even as they were dying from families and friends and work colleagues who could not accept that they were gay. I found myself working in a society and in a healthcare system that often rejected and stigmatized my patients. And here I found a community that I knew I needed to advocate for. I established the first HIV AIDS clinic at the Minneapolis VA where I was on faculty. And I fought for and supported those brave men. I will always be grateful to them, those patients that I worked with during those early years of the epidemic, because they taught me what courage is and that love and acceptance are ultimately more powerful than hate and stigma, that caring will always be stronger than rejection and discrimination. And through this work, I was given the opportunity to live my core values of equity and diversity and social justice that had been shaped by my early life experiences. So I share with you one piece of advice. Embrace your core values and define what gives meaning to your life so that you can know the right way for you to give meaning to other people's lives. Establishing the AIDS clinic, surviving on the streets as a teenager, those are the experiences that have led me to live every day of my life serving one primary purpose, helping the most vulnerable people the ones that society is willing to abandon. And for me, my core values are stirred to passion by the reminder that, as many have said, the greatness of a society is defined by the way it treats its most vulnerable members. This, I believe, is the essence of being a doctor, the essence, graduates, of your new profession. As you treat individual patients, always view their actions and our actions through a lens that looks towards the society in which they live. We must celebrate the goodness in our society and be leaders in addressing its failings. People will bring much more than health challenges to your office. They will bring the harsh realities of life and their health issues will frequently represent symptoms of the disappointing inequalities in society. And this means to care for our patients, we must address system change. We must become involved in policy development and advocacy, and we must be community leaders who address these issues. So as you go forth in your careers, broaden your approach to a perspective that encompasses this bigger picture. Look beyond medical care to the underlying social factors that affect health and well-being. Raise your voice to educate what we, others about what we know to be true that health is determined only in small part, about 10%, by the care delivered in hospitals and clinics. That it is due in much larger part to the social determinants, factors such as income, education, safe housing, job opportunities, access to healthy foods, all the circumstances in which we live and work and play. Partner with businesses, governments, civic or organizations to address these social determinants these fundamental drivers of the health status of your patients. This is a big task, but it is one your time here at the University of North Dakota has prepared you to take on. The soul of the medical profession is filled with altruism, compassion, excellence, integrity, and honesty. These attributes are now part of your core values. This is your time to live those values, to drive new ways of thinking, to achieve important breakthroughs, and attain that ultimate goal, making people's lives better, and society stronger, kinder, and more just. 
Today, you take a huge step forward on your life journey of service to others. You are the future of this country's well-being. And I am confident that each of you will help fill the world with hope and happiness and health. I ask only that you heed Harriet Tubman's call to action as she said, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Congratulations, class of 2014. Live your dream, change the world. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Claire, for those uh, inspiring and uplifting comments. So are you ready for the challenge? Will the graduates please rise for the pledging of the Oath of Hippocrates, which is printed on the program? I would also invite any of the physicians in the audience and on stage who would care to do so to rise as well to join us by re-swearing the pledge of the oath and this is printed in, in your program. Colleagues, please take the oath with me at this time. Today, in the presence of family, friends, teachers, and colleagues, I dedicate myself to the profession of medicine. I pledge myself to the service of humanity. I will use my skills to care for all in need without bias and with openness of spirit. The health of my patients will be my first concern. I vow to host sacred the bond between doctor and patient. I will hold in confidence all that my patients entrust to me. I will strive to alleviate suffering. I will respect the dignity and autonomy of my patients in living and in dying. As a physician, I recognize my duty to society. I will work to promote health and prevent disease. I will advocate for the welfare of my community. Even under duress, I will not use my knowledge or my skills against humanity. I will acknowledge my limitations and my mistakes so that I may learn from them. To uphold these responsibilities, I will maintain my own well-being and the well-being of those close to me. I will promote the integrity of the practice of medicine. In the tradition of my profession, I honor all who teach me this art. Through honest and respectful collaboration with my colleagues, I will uphold the highest standards in the service of patients. I will seek new knowledge, re-examine ideas and practices of the past, and teach what I have learned. Above all, the health of my patients will be my first concern. This oath I take freely and upon my honor. I would ask the graduates to, uh, to be, to please remain standing. The candidates for the degrees in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences will be presented by Dean Wynn. President Kelly, these candidates have completed all the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. I, therefore, have the honor of presenting them to you for the conferring of this degree. And upon the recommendation of your faculty and by the authority given to me by the State Board of Higher Education, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Medicine with all of the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. I would ask the, the graduates to please uh, be seated and move at the direction of the marshals.
Julia O'Brien Baltz. Mandy Marie Baker. Mamie Rose Hextall. Eric S. Jacobson. Laura Beth Johnson. Natalie Francis Lichter. Laura Ruth Lewick. Tara Renee Mertz Hack. Tarek Nurkic. Summer Ray Wild Nurkic. Tabitha Ongsted. Ira Abraham Herzik. Michael Lee Schwalbe. Paul David Selid. Brooke Marie Settergren. Yeah. 
Zane Zacchaeus Young. Benjamin Charles Axman. <laughs> Joel Daniel Beachy. Travis Earhart Bentz. <laughs> Stefan Robert Leo Blanchard. Ryan Richard Bogner. Amy Michelle Enterline Conson. Abby Sue Davis. <laughs> Dustin Dominic Getz. Steve English. Michael Curtis Junt. Laura Elizabeth Knudsen. Aaron Charlene Metzold. Jared Alexander Marquart. Brittany Ray Mache.
Brittany Katharina Snoosted. Jesse Larie Arneson. Catherine Elizabeth Arnold. Brittany Nicole Berg. <laughs> Stephanie Ray DeYoung. Joseph Paul Dinsmore. Courtney Christine Drops. Scott Gerald Erpelding. <laughs> Elizabeth Claire Ewing. Jason Timothy Henry. Patrick William Lamb. Tyler James Larson. Dane Jason Mittenis. Tara Ann Nelson. Jill Marie Olson. Jaredon Matthew Brian Ruff.
Rupa Lakshmi Sharadanand. Caleb Patrick Skipper. Edward Michael Urell. Daniel Robert Almquist. Nathan Dean Carpenter. Joel Michael Erickson. Christopher John Failing. Christina Marie Harmon. James Ronald Hegvik. <laughs> Christian Ratilal Jethwa. Brian Lee Johnson. Lacey Lynn Kessler. Sergei Vadimovich Kulikov. Samuel Kenneth Lowstrader. William D. Longhurst. <laughs> Amanda Elizabeth Skifton. Shireen Tollett.
Caleb Lawrence Top. Well, this is my opportunity to say a few words to our graduating class here in medicine. Before I do, I just want to extend another welcome to all of our families, all of you who are here to help celebrate the achievement of this class on this beautiful, beautiful spring afternoon here at the University of North Dakota. I have to tell you on a personal level how much I enjoy listening to the children's cries, the little babies and the infants, because I know these are future freshmen at the University of North Dakota. <laughs> you know, as I was listening to all of the comments about this class, I could only feel a certain amount of envy and excitement. You have been given some of the finest instruction in basic and clinical medicine that we could possibly provide here at the University of North Dakota. You're going to be going off here in a few days to your residency training. You're going to be spending a few more years developing specialty awareness, specialty knowledge, clinical skills. I'm very excited for you because these are times that uh, very few people actually uh, have a chance to, uh, to develop their, their personal skills and their personalities in this particular way. I also want to share with you that you've been given a great deal here at the university. Everyone in this room has contributed to your being here. We have given you the very best that we can possibly provide you in medical education. You have learned some of the finest, most contemporary techniques and diagnostics. You've developed some skills with some of the most sophisticated instruments that are present anywhere in the world. So a great deal has been given to you. In return, we expect a great deal back in a few more years, and I want every one of you to come home to North Dakota. I want you to come back and help us with urban, rural medicine. We're going to be uh, sending some of you out into the frontiers to practice in ways that you have never been challenged before. So I can't tell you the excitement that I feel for your future. It's going to be a grand time, and I know that you're going to do very, very well. Now, oftentimes you come through these ceremonies and you think to yourself a few years later, boy, I don't remember a single thing about that, so here it comes. This is what I want you to remember as your president. I know that in a few more months, some of you are going to have been on service, on duty for three, four days straight. You are not going to have any sleep. You're going to feel terrible. You're going to be exhausted, and you're probably going to start feeling a little bit of depression, maybe. You're going to feel very, very sad. <laughs> I want you to think back on the fact of something that you know. You have trillions of cells in your body, and all they care about is you. Ladies and gentlemen, the medical class of 2014. <laughs> <laughs>